the uh, first journals, what they did is they could publish scientific papers. Today, with the web, we can do more than that. Uh, there's not just scientific papers. There are many other ways of, uh, of sharing scientific ideas, scientific data and information uh, with others. It's really, really much, much cheaper to put stuff online and no need to charge for it anymore. And if you don't charge for it anymore, then everybody can access it. Now that is really democratizing because uh, it's not just that you know uh, Newton and Galton and those, those people can uh, exchange information with each other or people at big universities like Columbia can, uh, can see it because their library uh, put many, many uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars into journals. But uh, a, a scientist in a, in a budding scientific community in Morocco can also read the same thing use the same data, see the same video, and promote him or, his, or herself uh, because he's smart, has good ideas, maybe doesn't have the infrastructure at home to utilize, to actually do what needs to be done, but he can get in touch with others who can and collaborate. This is one of the papers in PLOS One. PLOS One is uh, an experimental journal in the sense that it doesn't have a theme or topic. Topic it, uh, covers all of science. We get a lot of interdisciplinary uh, manuscripts which really don't fit anywhere else. Uh, another thing is that it really is trying to uh, connect the scientific paper, this kind of uh, old style uh, way of, of communicating uh, with the rest of the uh, uh, online ecosystem. So see we can have uh, notes and comments that people post on there and uh, user ratings uh, where, where people rate but also trackbacks. So when somebody writes a blog post uh, it's directly connecting to this paper and the paper is connecting back. In the future a scientific paper instead of being a discrete thing which has a date of publication and a place of publication is going to be a much more dynamic process thing where a number of different people are going to do different parts of the study and posting them online in real time and then only in the end you put all those pieces together and call them a paper. This is a study. So you don't have to wait until everything is done then you submit and then suddenly secrecy is over, you're open. There's actually a definition now on Wikipedia and if you're interested in um, you know links articles and all, all that kind of thing you can go but the idea is very simple is that if you're doing research as an experimentalist in the lab you keep a lab notebook if you make that lab notebook completely public in as close to real time as you can that's open notebook science so what that means is that you know you don't decide I'm gonna share this experiment but not this one and the reason for that is we really want to see how science happens and we want to see the failures as well as the successes. We want to see the errors get corrected. We want to see how the whole thing happens. So that's basically what I mean by open notebook science. Now, again, going back to some of the concepts that Bora was uh, mentioning, we want to be able to track the provenance of the information as it goes through. And one of the things we forget when we read a journal article or a book is we start to believe what it actually says are facts. Right? But any measurement, right, there's actually no such thing as a fact. Every measurement is embedded within assumptions. And if you don't know what those assumptions are, then you're missing out on information and you don't know what, how much value to place on, the, on that piece of information. So I'll be talking about solubility throughout my talk and I'll, I'll give you a reason why a little bit later. But right now, let's say that we have this, this table, right, and we have all these data points. So this is the solubility of these different compounds in chloroform. And as a chemist, something looks really weird to me because these compounds are really similar to each other. However, one of the numbers is extremely low, 0.07, where all the other ones are at least 1.75. So if this were, if this were in a table, in a, in a journal, what, what, what can you do really? All you have to do is say, well, I guess it's an anomalous compound. Well, with Open Notebook Science, you can actually ask the question, what is wrong with that particular number? So I will dig in to see how that it, measurement was actually made. So it, it turned out that that wasn't correct. It was re-measured at 3.6, which makes a lot more sense. 
But let's see how I could actually figure out that there was a problem. So if I go to the actual lab notebook page where that measurement was made, you see here in green is highlighted that at 9.30 they placed the, the vial in the speed vac and they removed it at 3.30. So it spent six hours under a high vacuum. And I know that that's enough to evaporate the compound that we were just talking about. The other thing you'll notice is that they did not record the vacuum pressure. They did not record the time they vortexed. So it's actually just as important to know what the, the researcher did not measure as it is than simply to assume that they did a great job and they did you know, take care of, of every parameter. So this is the kind of thing that we want to resolve with open notebook science. We have some problems in this new discipline. The, the, the first problem is that this idea of biological parts, which we call biobricks, they don't currently exist. Um, so we have to invent them. And we have to invent a means to describe them and a means to, to share them so that they can be easily reused by, by other people. The second problem we have is that a lot of people who are attracted to synthetic biology are engineers and computer scientists and people from backgrounds other than biology. And I, I was a mechanical engineer originally. And, and that means that we, don't, we typically don't have the sort of the training, both practical and in the classroom, um, about a lot of uh, sort of standard molecular biology techniques. So we have, these, we have these two problems. And I think the second problem is sort of an interesting extension of what Boro was talking about earlier, where you have, uh, you have the problem where, because information has been sort of uh, localized and hard to get access to, if you're, if you're at a non-major research in institution, it's, it's hard to get access to that information. There's another problem where even if people who are at, at major research institutions, if they're trying to change the, the sort of the discipline that they're, that they're working on or they're trying to apply their technology to some new field, it's hard to learn about that new field. I'm going to tell you just two short anecdotes related to this registry of standard biological parts. The, the first is, is, uh, is one of these parts that, that I was uh, working on during my PhD, it, part number BBAF2620. It's a, it's a very simple little part that basically just uh, lets bacterial cells talk to each other. It's like the receiver in your radio or cell phone, and it's not very interesting. Everybody knows how the, the biology and the science of this works, but it's very, very useful. Um, the only problem is that the traditional means of sharing information about, about something like this is through the published literature. And it, it, uh, the journals tend not to celebrate small pieces of information that aren't uh, enormous, new, exciting discoveries. Um, so the, the means we, we chose to, uh, to share our description of this, of this part that we had engineered was via a data sheet. So this is the data sheet for BBAF2620. And, it, and we did a bunch of measurements on how this part behaves. And we put them on this data sheet. And it's intended to be presented in a, in a form, and well, it's hard to see here, but it's intended to be presented in a form that if, if someone comes along and wants to use this part, all the information is contained on this data sheet so they can use it. Um, and that's sort of different from having to troll the literature to find out everything that, that you might need to know about a part. This is sort of a summary of of, of this part and how you, how you need to go about using it. Um, and while we were taking all these measurements, uh, this data sheet was evolving. It was, it was online. It was both on the registry of standard biolog biological parts, and it was also on open wetware, which I'm going to talk about later. So we were putting all the data up as we were, as we were taking it. I'm not I, I don't think we were as, uh, as diligent and detailed as, as Jean-Claude described, and that was really nice to see. But, Basically, once, it, once we had data, it went up on the, on the wiki and was, was available to people to use. And so eventually, we ended up publishing the, uh, 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 this work in a, in a sort of a traditional journal. Um, but we were able to include uh, a pretty interesting sentence. A portion of it is, is here. And it, we said that we made freely available the DNA encoding BBAF2620 and its data sheet via the registry of standard biological parts. Already 18 higher order systems incorporating the receiver, which is BBAF2620, have been contributed back to the registry. And that's sort of unusual in the traditional uh, publishing system whereby the first people get to see of your work is when it appears in the journal. Whereas we were able to write in the paper, we've already been uh, sharing the information and the physical DNA for this part and people have been using it and it's useful.